Hello, welcome everyone to this webinar. We are going to speak about cities. We are live from COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, and we are going to try to answer the question, how can cities unlock the opportunities of the ecological transition? I'm very happy today to have four speakers to present you. Bertrand Picard, president and founder of the Solar Impulse Foundation. Welcome. Mayor Carlos Moedas, mayor of the city of Lisbon and former commissioner for the European Union. Thomas Osdova, program director at Net Zero Cities and Magali Anderson, Chief Innovation and Sustainability Officer at OSIM. Um, if you go to the next slide, first, sorry, I'm Alexandra Baracan. I'm the Strategic Project Lead at the Solar Impulse Foundation, and I will be your host and moderator for today. Um, let's take a look at our agenda for today. First, Bertrand Picard will present you what the Foundation has been doing to support the implementation of sustainable solutions in city. Then I will uh, walk you through the content of our new report launched today, uh, the Solution Guide for Cities. And then we will do a 30 minutes panel discussion to try to understand beyond the technology what is needed for cities to implement sustainable solutions. And then we'll have a short Q&A. Thank you. So Bertrand, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexandra, and hello to everyone. At the COP27, where we are now, we hear a lot of speeches that are repeating the list of all the problems of climate change. And it ends by, we have to do something. But it should start by saying we have to do something and then explain what to do and how to do it. And this is exactly what we try to contribute with the Solar Impulse Foundation. We would like to show that fighting climate change is a fantastic opportunity, not only for humankind, not only for the planet and for the climate, but also for the economy, for job creation, for purchase power. We'd like to show that committing to ambitious NDCs, national determined contribution, is not a sacrifice. It's a fantastic advantage to develop the countries who need to be developed, to give access to energy, to the one who have no energy, to improve quality of life. But it's not enough to claim finding climate change is a profitable opportunity. We have to prove it. And this is what we have done during the five last years by identifying and selecting and assessing more than 1,450 solutions in the field of water, energy, construction, mobility, industry, agriculture, circular economy, waste management, in order to prove that the solutions exist today, that they are profitable, that they can protect the environment and reconcile ecology and economy, bringing a lot of arguments to the people who are resisting to the fight against the protection of the environment. But 1,450 solutions in every sector of course, it's a lot. Sometimes people don't know where to start when they are looking for solutions. And this is why we are launching at the COP27 right now, during this webinar, the Guide of Solutions for Cities, specifically for cities. And this is why we have Carlos Murdas, who is the mayor of Lisbon. This is why we have Thomas Osboda, who is leading the uh, Net Zero Cities Initiative. And Alexandra now is going to explain you how this guide for solutions is built, how we have developed it. And uh, she is the mother of this guide. She has been working with her team to make it a reality. So I give her the word now. She will explain it. And then we will open the debate and see how a mayor can use it, how a coalition for net zero emissions uh, can can spread it everywhere to all the people who need it and can implement it. So, Alexandra, you have the word. Thank you, Bertrand. So I invite you just to go to the next, next, next slide. Just to jump forward. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start just by showing you three numbers that we see everywhere. So it's not new. I think the first one is just to say that cities are actually contributing to a large part of global greenhouse gases emission. The other one is to say that this is going to increase because normal people are going to live in cities. But the, more, the most interesting one is the last one because it's saying how much there is an opportunity for cities to seize the sustainable transition because they are a driver of economic growth. So if you go to the next slide. 
What's happening today is that cities are really taking pledges to become carbon neutral or net zero. Uh, 240 and more cities have done this already. And there is actually a great opportunity to take action in cities. It could reduce by 90% the current, the current uh, emissions in cities. And that's a number for the International Energy Agency. And this is also because cities are the very specific ecosystem. They have the leverage that nobody, that none of them have. They can become incubator for solution, test ground for sustainable solutions. And they can also have an influence locally to really push forward the adoption of solution within the businesses that are within their territories. That's why we want to work with cities and for cities to help them implement solutions. If you go to the next one. So here is to explain to you how we came together with this guide. With the foundation, we have worked to uh, find solutions and uh, certify them as clean and profitable for the past five years, as Bertrand said. And what we did once we had uh, a large number of them is to ask them, how do you work with cities? What are your stories of implementation? Can you tell us what happened for you when you were working in or with cities? And we collected almost 200 successful case studies of sustainable technologies implemented today in an urban setting. This is how we built the guide. And looking at all those stories, we said, what are they solving in terms of problem, environmental challenges for those cities? That's how we built the structure of this guide that we're going to launch today. Um, on the next slide, something that's very interesting to note is because we started from the voice of this market of entrepreneur in the clean tech business. And we can see that there are specific characteristics that come back all the time around how they built their value proposition to be interesting in the market, to be attractive to customers, which are cities or businesses. And here you see a few examples of them, modular, flexible, energy passive, uh, mutilation of assets, non-invasive. This is something that's important because that comes, that's talking about the solutions that are available today and how they are trying to make a difference and be attractive in the market. If you go to the next slide. So here you see the five main sectors that we cover in the guide for cities. They are very classic ones. It's in energy, mobility, uh, water system, construction and building. So you've seen them already. They all have in common one thing is that they are an opportunity to work on quality of life in city. Uh, that can be greenhouse gas emission, air quality, water use, land use. So everything is linked. And this is where we, we think we need to make, make an action and where we think we need to implement solutions. These are also sectors where there are today inefficiencies. Inefficiencies in the way we use resources, in the way we use energy. That's where we need to take action. We'll go to the next slide. So here, um, from the sectors, we have defined 48 uh, different challenges that are to be solved by cities to to really become sustainable. They are across those five chapters, and each of the in each of them we want to see everywhere in the value chain where you can act. And it's not only about game changing solution, high impact solution. It's also it's also about incremental changes. The importance is to show that. We can take action at many different stages. It's not only decarbonizing materials uh, in the construction business, which is crucial. It's also being more sustainable in the way we design building, in the way we uh, put them together, in the way we use them. So each chapter will really deep dive in all the value chain that is concerned by the sector. If you go to that, yeah, perfect. So this is the map of all the case studies that we have gathered. It's showing 188 points of uh, successful stories. And what we want to do for the future, it's not only to stop at this map, it's to engage with cities, work with them, and have more dots on this map. That's the objective of the foundation. I want to zoom on one dot, which is an example of case study that I think was interesting to show. Um, this is about uh, making building more efficient when it, when it comes to using energy for ventilations. This is a, a crucial, impor of crucial importance in universities, in, in classrooms. So this solution is called Light Fee, which has received the label by the Solar Impulse Foundation, has developed a system to enable in 10 minutes to install a system that is using existing Wi-Fi network for mobile phone um, of students in the room to understand how many people are in the room and to connect with existing building energy management system and tell them to use less power for ventilation when it's not needed. And this seems simple, this seems easy to implement. The result has been minus 84% uh, energy use for ventilation in that classroom. So this is absolutely a great result. And we have a lot more stories in this guide. We're going to show stories around how can cities use, make better use of their land when they have to develop uh, buildings, how can they better plan for group transportation, and how they can fight heat urban islands, for instance. 
But it's not only about solution. So on the next slide, you'll see the guide is divided in two parts. The first part is showing the success stories and the case studies. The other part is comes from the collaboration with external entities that already work with cities to help them implement those solutions on the ground. So we've partnered with 10 of them and we are in the middle of it providing the solution, but there is a need for the key enabling framework for actually implementing them. And I'm happy to have Thomas Osdova today who is representing Net Zero Cities who contributed to this guide and uh, is going to tell us more about what they are doing to support cities in, that, uh, in this challenge. On the next slide, I'm going to introduce the key topics of our panel because now we know we have the solution. We're going to show it in this guide, the example, the technology. We want to discuss what's actually needed in terms of enabling framework. So you have solutions, so now what do you do? And we're going to speak about knowledge and capacity. Do cities need more knowledge and more capacity to implement the solution and why? We're going to speak about public procurement. How can we change, change the criteria, uh, make them evolve and adapt to the actual availability of solutions? Uh, we're going to speak about the risking technologies and we're going to speak about financing. So in the next slide, I'm happy to start this uh, panel and we are going to, um, to have three complementary viewpoints here that are very interesting. First, we have a person that is actually on the ground in city, the mayor of Lisbon. So thank you very much for being here today, Carlos Moedas. We have a person who is developing, um, I would say, tools for cities, for groups of cities to become more efficient in implementing solutions. So thank you, Thomas Osdova. And we have an, what is crucial to sustainable cities. It's uh, someone from the private sector in the construction sector. So thank you, Magali Anderson, for being here. I'm going to start this panel with you, Carlos. And um, I, I would like to have your point of view and to open that topic because you have both sides of the story. You worked as a commissioner for research and innovation uh, at the European Union, and now you are uh, the mayor of a city. So from your experience in Lisbon, what would you say are the key barriers for cities to implement the sustainable solutions that we described before? My sound now is okay. I'm sorry I was muted, but um, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank uh, Bertrand. Um, I think that Bertrand has been uh, over the years a great inspiration for me uh, as a commissioner and now as a mayor. And I think that the inspiration that I got from Bertrand is to deal with these 1000 solutions. And to be frank, when I was a commissioner, I probably didn't understand fully the importance of these 1000 solutions. And these 1000 solutions are really the translation to the ground of the importance of everything that the supranational organization or the targets that we all uh, want to achieve internationally to translate that in the language that people understand. And uh, when I, as a mayor, I go on the streets, what I feel is that most people, they want to do something about the environment but they don't understand how. And so the solutions are really the concrete areas, the concrete solutions that a mayor uh, in a small town or a big town can contribute for achieving the targets. And that's essential, uh, especially in a city like ours, like in Lisbon, where people want to help. People are really in the mood to help, but they ask you, what can we do? And I think that that going from what I in the commission call the missions to the concrete solutions, it's absolutely crucial to achieve what we want. And let me give you a couple uh, of examples. Uh, I think that uh, when I started here in Lisbon, one of my major, major policies was to have public transportation for free for the young people and the elderly people. That was something very unique. I mean, there was very few cities, especially capital cities that are doing that. But then people understood that I was doing that not on a social measure, but really a contribution to decarbonize, to get to our city to be carbon neutral for 2030. The same thing with the public procurement. If you want, uh, and I know that you guys have looked into it, I mean, if you have a municipality, your public procurement has to be in a way that you are giving the right incentives for people and for companies and not just the price. You have to really put incentives for innovation, incentives for sustainability, and then people follow, they understand. Uh, and so the examples that I try to, to achieve, they are quite simple, like uh, we're basically now using water 
to water the gardens, uh, used water instead of drinkable water. Uh, and so we're doing that now already in 30 hectares here in the city. And so all those things that come exactly from solutions that can be yours or, or others uh, are essential. And so Lisbon really wants to be part of it. And I really want to be part of your effort of the 1000 solutions, because I think this is the only way forward. I think that uh, all the discussion has been at the level of basically the supranational institutions, then the countries. But I think that what Bertrand was describing is that a lot of the people that go to the COP, basically, uh, they don't have the concrete solutions. The cities are the places where it happens. And we are such an amazing platform. I mean, if I look at the city of Lisbon, we have 1.2 billion euros of budget, uh, which is more than most of the ministries of the country, uh, if you want to. And then you can apply that exactly to very concrete things. Um, you know, if you do recycling, if you do anything related to efficiency, uh, everything can be done by the mayors. And I think that the COP somehow has to actually go to, to that level and the contribution uh, of Bertrand has been amazing uh, on that matter. And uh, of course, Lisbon will be on the forefront of the 1000 solutions and, and be very engaged on, on these translation, what I call the translation to uh, the right level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want just to come back when you said that they want to do something, but they always ask, what can we do? So with the foundation, we are trying to show options and, and put forward solutions. But I, I'm curious to have your opinion, Thomas Osdoba, because you work with coalitions of cities. So you see a lot of different way to approach this. What can we do? So my question would be, do they know the solution? Some city, do they actually identify solutions on the what spots? And what do you do if they don't? How do you help them? What do they need? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that, uh, Alexandra. And, and uh, to the mayor for his uh, great remarks as well on this process and the importance of uh, putting cities in a leading position in responding to some of these demands. I think part of the principle of the European mission for helping 100 cities become climate neutral by 2030 is grounded in, in, is grounded in a couple of points that respond to your question. One is that we know there are many solutions uh, that are being and can be deployed, but what cities do not yet know is how to deploy those at the speed and scale necessary to achieve those outcomes. Um, and some of that speaks to how cities are structured. It speaks to the need for a better enabling environment. Uh, I think referencing the mayor's comments about national governments and enabling cities to be able to take the actions required. Um, and then it also uh, relates to the work that needs to be done to structure markets for scale deployment of the right impact. Right now, a lot of markets are structured to get a lot of impact, but not or a lot of scale, but not necessarily at the deepest impact we need. Or if we have something that can deliver deep impact, it's not quite ready to scale uh, from a market perspective. And so that market structuring work, that market shaping work needs to be undertaken. And that's a function of policy as well as institutional design and, and, and deployment model design. Because a lot of things we're really good at deploying in single projects, but not as full portfolios. And so that's part of the process we need to undertake. And just a follow-up question, but how do they, how do they learn to, to put in place the right framework? How do, they, how do they learn from each other or how do they make the, those decisions? Yeah, the, it, it's a great question. I'd say there are a combination of, of factors. One is cities are, are quite good at and very well oriented towards learning from each other and borrowing from each other things that they know work uh, in those situations. And so one of the things we're doing in Net Zero Cities is taking that principle and building a city learning program that really makes that as robust as possible an approach um, to helping cities learn as quickly as possible. But I think it goes farther than that. It's not just peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's also helping cities to create um, create space for a level of experimentation and learning that is traditionally quite difficult to achieve in the city context. Uh, and so part of our job is in, in, related to net zero cities is to provide not just access to all of the resources that exist and, 
and the this initiative is one of the you know is an example of of uh, the great tools and resources and connections to solutions that exist for this work but to help cities then see those and grapple with hard questions around how to get to the right scale and the right level of impact. Uh, and that requires a collaboration model that I think is a little bit different than just giving cities access to solutions and resources. It's actually a long-term partnership to help them to learn together how to deploy these at the scope and scale that we need. You said something about the, the need for structuring the markets and to, to scale. So I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Gali. You are, you are the part of Allsim, who is part of the first mover coalition. So for those who don't know, uh, it's a uh, hard to, to abate sector coming together because it represents a large part of CO2 emission emitted and trying to put the markets in the right direction to push towards the implementation of sustainable solution. So my question would be, how do you, when you work on market drivers and when you have because you have the influence on the market how do you connect that with the requirements of cities so hi alexandra very happy to be here with you very happy to talk about solutions as better introduced i just heard because i heard really people talking about collaboration, people talking about how do we get more solution out there. And I think this guide is going to help so much. So uh, in, in that guide, for example, there are seven of our solution. And I will just name two, because for the question of scalability and the question of how do we get uh, more of them out there, one of them is our low carbon concrete called Ecopact. It's, so it's one of the solution in the guide. and. Uh, this is a concrete that is between 30% to 70% lower CO2 than your local concrete. We launched it two years ago. Today, we represent 15% of our total sales. So scalability is not a problem. We could, I mean, I don't know how many companies have launched a product that went to 15% in less than two years. So they go back and they can use it. I don't think so. I would love to think so, but I don't think so. I hope that that will help. And another one I want to mention, because I think it's so important in the current environment, we have um, a product called Hydromedia, which is a relatively porous concrete. And what it does is that it absorbs four to 500 liters of water per second per square meter. So basically things of flooding, things of evacuation of those big heavy rain that we start seeing nowadays. Think of having trees and beating human heat island effect by having more trees in the, in the streets thanks to that product. All these products, you know, um, New York City actually adopted it and explained how they could have the water evacuated much quicker. They exist, they're on the shelf, they're scalable. We could serve every single city in the world tomorrow morning with them. So it would city so we can deploy them way more rapidly thank you magali and i, I want to move uh, further on that question because if they knew are they going to change the way they build the criteria for the procurement process for instance do you do you see that happening when you work with cities on their infrastructure projects so, so we i can't say we haven't we've have seen it yet but um i've seen for example we were discussing with los angeles and los angeles introduced the requirement in every public procurement to have what we call EPDs, Environmental Product Declaration, which is basically for each product we use to have the full life cycle assessment of the CO2 footprint. That makes a major difference because now there is a straight requirement for low carbon and low carbon products become more relevant into the tender process than it was. Today, unfortunately, there's still too much intermediate between the cities and the building material supplier. And the intermediates are the developers, the construction companies, etc., etc., who are not necessarily, you know, the African tam tam doesn't necessarily work all the way between the building material supplier and the, the city to show all the solutions. So putting them in public procurement would be is a magic stick to make it happen super, super fast. 
Thank you, Magali. Uh, very interesting example for the Los Angeles uh, procurement system. Bertrand, do you want to react on this? Yes. Yes, I'd like to react because there are some low carbon cement. There is uh, heat pumps to divide by five the energy bill of a house. Uh, there is some decarbon, there is some recycled concrete, for example, uh, that is available. We can do 100% recycled concrete, but who can really decide and at which level that these heat pumps will be implemented? that this, carb, this uh, low carbon cement will be used, that this recycled uh, concrete is going to be used instead of normal concrete. Wh wh what is the process, I would say, between the solution and the reality of the implementation? So this is a great question for Thomas. Mm -hmm. When you see cities taking pledges to become carbon neutral, how do you see them working from the target to changing the way they do, changing the, the criteria, changing the, the standards? Yeah, this is a terrific example. So um, <clears throat> it's almost as Bertrand and I spoke about this in advance. Um, I want to speak to the to the question of heat pumps in particular. I think that we, increasingly it's become well documented in a variety of different climate zones and building building. Uh, contexts that heat pumps are a compelling alternative to other more traditional heating and cooling systems that rely on fossil fuels. Um, and obviously with a caveat that because they run on electricity, it, it elevates our need to accelerate the decarbonization of the electrical grid, uh, which is something that is well underway. But I want to talk about two points specifically on that. Uh, and, and back to Bertrand's point, who determines how that gets deployed is a critical question. And we're seeing this play out right now in the energy crisis situation where um, the conversation is often saying, well, heat pumps are, are an available option. But for many individual homeowners, the, the ability to make a very rapid choice to deploy a heat pump may be beyond their reach for a variety of reasons. One is time, two is knowledge, about what's available and how to secure it. And three is capital. Um, there is a payback that can be calculated around uh, the deployment of a heat pump for a furnace replacement or a boiler replacement. But in many cases, it may not be within the reach of an individual homeowner. And so one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, um, is it the appropriate pathway to put that responsibility on individual building owners when really, if we're looking for systemic transformation of the entire energy system, that's something that we should be doing at a larger scale through a better deployment model that takes that responsibility and burden off of individual uh, building owners. And I'll give you an example of where you're starting to see the potential for that emerge. So in, in many cities across Europe now, you're seeing initiatives called energy communities, which are designed to help people within a defined geographic neighborhood work together around several aspects of the energy uh, energy challenge and, and the, the changes that we need to go through. Well, one of the things that could be included is the actual physical deployment of solutions that reduce emissions instead of at an individual building scale, but rather at a community scale. Um, to do that, it requires different kinds of engagement. It's likely to require some policy changes, and it's certainly going to be a quite disruptive deployment model in the system. However, if we did those things, not only would we get to impact faster, but the economics of that deployment would be far easier to manage uh, at, at a significant scale with an effective deployment model uh, that is oriented towards those kinds of upfront investments and financial returns over time. So that's just one example. Can I just, uh, Alexander, Thank you very can I much. Just yes, Yes, I was just uh, giving you a little bit of a perspective of uh, uh, the local politics and, and the politician, which is that um, it's very difficult today for a politician to decide to go for a solution that is slightly more expensive, but it's much better for sustainability and for the environment. Uh, the scrutiny that you are under every day makes that you look at the short term and sometimes you're afraid to look at the long term 
for so many reasons and the long term you're not going to be there uh, and so that's probably i mean that's individualistic but that's that's what it is but it's also because uh in general you can have your name on the newspaper and people can tell that you did the wrong thing when it's actually you know it's right you know when i arrived i i started uh, talking uh to my people that we had to go immediately and change all the lighting system for leds and it's really difficult. I mean, it's not something that you go from, and I, I knew it. I mean, we talked with Bertrand for ages and ages ago in other cities and, and you have to put all the processes. And that's why we're changing our procurement system to really be able to protect also the politician that we are taking the right decision. And so uh, that's probably I, I just like my two cents on uh, uh, the fact that some of the, the local politicians are, are afraid of taking some decisions because then you are liable for those decisions uh, personally, not just as a politician, but also personally. What do you think would help you to make those decisions actually? To... Look, I think that there's uh, several things. One is to change the public procurement rules seriously. And that also comes from the European Union because sometimes the public procurement rules are so strict Mm -hmm. and they're done in a way that is not sensible sensible to the fact that the people on the ground know better and so you are almost afraid sometimes of getting to a solution that is not strictly like what the public procurement rules say and that you basically can be attacked for that and that is something that for me and i've seen it from the european uh, way that the public procurement has to, has to be more adapted to the to the climatic transition i mean it was like a snapshot it's a law that was strict and a snapshot for something in the past and that has to evolve that's the first thing the second thing is that we need also people like you to be more present on the ground uh, people like thomas like bertrand and all of you to come to our cities and to basically make that communication of talking to people, involving people. I have created here what I call a, a, a people assembly. And I randomly pick 50 people every six months and they come and they spend a weekend with us in the municipality, giving ideas about climate, uh, anything related to the city solutions. And uh, I would be very happy if one day you can come, you are all invited to be part of that experience. And you'll see that when you're close to people, then you can explain things in a different way. And then of those 50, those that have the best ideas, they come and they work with us. They stay, they come to meetings, they, they basically implement those ideas. Um, and so that's something that we have to be really, really close to the people. And I think that um, most of your organizations uh, sometimes you are very close to uh, the political power and close uh, to people at the European level. And now uh, is the time that you really work with the cities. And I know that you are doing that work, but I'm just, what I'm saying is that you have to do a little bit more. You have to be more present. And the Net Zero Cities is a great example of that. The 1000 Solution is a great example of that. Uh, and uh, I hope that we can work more. I kind of, my feeling is that I, I feel a little bit alone uh, uh, somehow uh, from uh, what's going on at the level of your organizations, even in terms of the subjects. Even it, so we need, uh, cities need to be more involved. This is easy to say, it's probably more difficult to do, uh, but I think that's the way to go. Absolutely, Carlos. We are here for you. And uh, of course, this guide of cities exists precisely to give you more tools, to give you more communication. Now, you're absolutely right when you say that you cannot introduce something in your city that is more expensive than the, the mainstream. But when we see, for example, the low carbon, concrete, low, low carbon cement, which is the same price than normal cement, sometimes even a bit cheaper. If we see the way to recycle concrete, that doesn't make it more expensive at all. So we can admit that in, I, I believe all the solutions in the guide are cheaper solutions, but it's true that this is cheaper over maybe 10 years and it needs a little bit more investment in the beginning. But who has the power, for example, to, to say that in a city, it will be low carbon cement. Is it the mayor? Is it the 
assemblies in the municipalities in the countries in Europe. This is also interesting for the people to understand who is taking really the decision. I think I think better is also the fact that a lot of these solutions be, they have, as Thomas was saying, they have a huge impact, but they don't have the scale. So if you are building, let's imagine I'm starting like a, a big construction for forty thousand apartments, uh, and if I want to have that kind of concrete, um, probably I I will not have the the, the amount that I need uh, for that project or I will have just one uh, company that can deliver that. And all the other companies that deliver like the, the traditional one, they, uh, they are all around the, the, the local authorities. They know their way in, uh, they know uh, to put uh, the beads, they, they know everything. And so I think that there's a, that transition also is about having more people, more producers that go into that direction. And so it's a little bit like the LED lamps, right? Everybody knows it from like the last 10 years. Um, but still, I mean, it, it takes a huge time, uh, even when economically it makes sense. What, what I wanted to say is that it's not just the making is, uh, is sense economically that, as you said, these solutions are cheaper, but the puzzle around getting these contracts, the whole system was not designed for those companies, were designed for the traditional companies. Um, and so even if it's everything looks uh, great, it's sometimes is, is not easy on the ground. Uh, you don't know where they are. You don't know where they look for. Is there a guarantee uh, for 10 years that the building will be perfectly fine with that type of concrete compared to others? So all those things that worry the mayors, sometimes it's just you go the easy way. And the easy way is to do exactly what others have done before you. You don't uh, have any maybe... incentive, you know. It's uh, But sorry about that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm okay. I'd like Magali to react to that. I think it's uh, it could be very interesting to have a viewpoint on this. And so, if your city is near a uh, hosting place, and actually I'm not sure we are near this one, we would have enough product. There is no question about it. And as an international company, we would never produce or provide a concrete that would not be following all the international norms and standards, so that we can guarantee and the insurance will ensure your building so it's not going to collapse after a certain number of years. That's for sure. We would never sell anything else outside the norms. But to answer your question about the quantity, I think the movement is happening. And I don't want to advertise for my competitors here, but the Global Cement and Concrete Association has announced last year a go to zero map by 2050 for the concrete with all kind of commitment of reduction in the coming 10 years. So. What, what that's going to make makes that the basically the CEOs of the company representing 80% of the production of cement outside China have all committed. So that low carbon concrete, you don't only need to wait for whole seed because I understand the competitive tendering process. I really expect it to become way more available, way quicker than we actually think. Thank you, Magali. Um, uh, I want to just come back and ask uh, Thomas Ozdoba about a number I saw on the Net Zero City platform, which said that 17% only of the fundings will come from cities when it comes to implementing solutions. Uh, the, other, the other rest will come from the private sectors, from, um, from building owners, etc. So my question would be, how do you think cities can work together or act to crowding investment? And it, it comes back to also what Carlos was saying about the, the need for uh, high investment and how it's not always easy for one city to take that risk? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. It's an important one. And, and, and I would say just in our work already, it's quite clear that for cities, if we're not prepared to help them with that question at the beginning of the process, it's a real barrier to engagement because I think cities are quite aware that it's beyond their capability to finance the transition by themselves to, to climate neutrality. So what we're trying to do involves three basic elements. One of the first elements is to work with each city to be quite uh, clear about what they anticipate their total capital requirements to be 
over the entire period of going from where they are now to climate neutrality. Now, of course, that starts with some pretty high level estimates, but if you don't start there, you're never really gonna have a good idea as to what the total ecosystem of capital you will need in order to achieve this outcome. So that's first. From there, you can begin to assess as each city within each national or regional context, what their capacity is for mobilizing some of that capital. Some of it will be funding and some of it will be financing. Um, and we know many cities have been able to access uh, capital through uh, the bond market, whether it's through general bonds or green bonds. Many cities have been able to work with the European Investment Bank to, to leverage project-based financing. Um, but on all of those fronts, that stops short of the kind of capital they're needed. So in every case, you're gonna have, here's our estimated total. Here's what we think in our city, we're capable of mobilizing ourselves. And then with the rest of that, what are the sources that we can begin to engage early in the process? Not once we have our projects, but before we have our projects uh, so that we can orient the, that capital to the kind of uh, financial performance that we anticipate these projects being able to deliver. Oftentimes there's a, just a disconnect between what the capital is looking for and how the projects perform financially. Um, that's not gonna be something a city is gonna be able to solve for itself. The scale is usually too small, even in big cities, to get the right kind of capital to come to the table there. So we're looking at trying to build capital structures that are pan-European, that are national, and potentially regional so that different kinds of investors can engage with cities and the activities that they need to take uh, in an effective way. Thank you. And I'm gonna go back to Carlos. Is this something that you are doing in the city of Lisbon? I think that uh, we, uh, uh, from our side, I think that one of the most interesting things uh, that we've done is really to put in our pro public procurement platform rules for sustainability. And I think that has been recognized uh, in uh, different prizes outside of uh, Portugal, because I think that uh, you have to push. I think that you have to pull and to push. But in the case of a municipality, you really have to push these uh, mechanisms and you have to make it in a way that it protects also the politician. And so uh, we've done that from a very early age of looking into the public procurement. And now we have in, in really included a lot of uh, norms and rules uh, to follow and to give the right incentives for uh, sustainability, for uh, really solutions that are new. So, for instance, if you have you are a company that are proposing something that is new, you get some more points. You get some more points in that innovation and in a way that you are innovating. And so those things you have to really to be very clear uh, and you have to do it and you have to sometimes pay the political price. But when it works, I think that is extremely uh, good for all of us. Carlos, when you were commissioner for innovation uh, at the European level, we were talking a lot about how to create new standards and new norms that would pull the innovation to the market by creating a necessity to use them. For example, new rules to be more efficient, for energy, new rules to be cleaner uh, for air pollution and things like that. Now that you are in the seat of the mayor of Lisbon, is it something that you can use? Can, can, can you do it? What, what are the standards and norms that you can make better in order to pull the solutions of the guides I think that at the level of the mayor is is actually quite easy because a lot of what you do, you can really uh, create those rules. So, for instance, if you have, uh, which we have every two years, a big uh, festival of songs and stuff that called Rock in Rio. So we can really decide that when they come, they have to contribute for the community. They have to have everything uh, around the whole uh, party has to be uh, recyclable, that they have to cre really follow all the rules that create an environment that basically respects the rules that the mayor imposes to them. If not, they have to pay more taxes, they have to pay more licenses. 
Then in terms of uh, the public uh, contracts, we also have our own rules. So I think that it's easier here at the level of the city to impose those rules that we talked so much when I was at the commission that being at the level of the national government, because you don't have the ability to do it at the national government. You deal with big contracts, you deal with uh, things that really have impact on the country. But basically what really can change is the small things at the level of the city. Uh, and so now we, we have, I, you know, we have the, the, our cruises here in Lisbon, these big boats that come with a lot of tourists. And so uh, they uh, were not used to pay anything. And I say, look, you have one. Your boats cannot be on fuel when they are stopped in Lisbon. You have to get them into an electrical plug and you cannot put the engines on. And everyone that gets out of the boat uh, has to pay a tax to get into the city. And so you really can create this, those rules in a very easy way with all uh, the process and the due process, but you really can create those rules. So in terms of the cruising boats, they will never be able to be again in Lisbon uh, where their engines are working stopped in the middle of the city. I mean, there's something that 10 years ago made sense or probably not, but it was part of the getting more tourists to Lisbon. And now it doesn't make any sense anymore. And we were able quickly to decide that with them. Uh, and so those... Uh, I think the, the, the devil is on the details and the solutions are also on the details and those details can be decided at the level of cities, I, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah, very inspiring to finish this panel. Uh, I want to let you all react if you have something to, to add to this. And if not, we will just go through the questions to take some questions from the, from the audience. I think just the one comment I would make in, in very short terms is that working through cities to get to the place where scale, where policy scale and capital can all work together in an effective way is one of the primary, I think, reasons why when we talk about trying to help cities to, to, to lead in the, in the deployment of solutions and to accelerate action, uh, it's really important because that's a, that's something that is almost impossible to do beyond the scale of a city or even within a, within a city beyond the scale of a particular district or, or community within the city. And I think that that represents a mindset that's good to bring to this process, particularly when innovation is necessary. We want to try things. We want to move quickly. The larger the scale, the slower that we move. Uh, the harder it is to do anything without a long, elaborate policy exercise and a quite overwhelming, you know, economic and financial analysis. So if we want to move quickly, we want to move at pace, we have to find that sweet spot. It's bigger than a building, it's smaller than a city, it's somewhere in between. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go through the first question. So it's for, um, Mayor Moedas, since 80% of existing buildings will still be in use by 2050, how much focus was or should be given to these existing buildings by the mayors? I think that uh, uh, really uh, touched on uh, one of the major points is that the legacy, uh, it's so big. I mean, everything that you can change on the flow you cannot change on the stock. And so we have a project with the European Investment Bank, uh, which is around 200 million euros, to basically to refurbish uh, and to uh, really change all these construction and all these apartments that were not fit for purpose in terms of uh, efficiency and energy efficiency. And so we've been working very hard on that because I think that when you look at it, it's the same thing with the cars, right? You look at most of the pollution in our city comes from the cars that I have more than 10 years. And so you have all these legacy of the past that is very difficult to get input to, um, to the update of today. Uh, and I think that the construction business, uh, and of course, who am I to talk? Uh, we have Magali here, um, and uh, uh, that is a specialist, but it's really one of the businesses that had more trouble to evolve uh, in the last 20 years. 
not just on the the raw materials like uh, concrete of course there's a lot of innovation on that side but on the processes on the waste on the way things are done uh, and so we are also trying to change with uh, with uh, the investors the ways that they really do the processes. We need to reprocess the whole thing in terms of construction, where you're designing a whole neighborhood. Uh, where do you start? Uh, why do you build there and then you build there? How do you kind of like create a view of the city where you can save time, energy and materials? Uh, but yes, we will uh, work very much uh, on that uh, matter, and we are investing more than 200 million on refurbishing housing, uh, refurbishing for apartments from everyone. I mean, uh, Lisbon is a city with a with a, a very very big social neighborhoods where we are investing in getting them to the norms, and so uh, yes, it's uh, it's super important and crucial for us. Thank you very much. Maybe Magali, you want to add something around the new processes that are needed? Well, I wanted to at least talk about one more solution in the guide, which is called Aerium. It's a mineral form that allows you to do great insulation of uh, your existing buildings. So we have solutions for everything, but I fully agree with what you are saying about the fact of how to rethink how we built is as important as the material. So we look at 3D printing, but also completely different ways of how we place the material, how we build more with less. There's a huge chapter we process and how we do it, 15 minutes and all these things can all. Thank you very much, Magali. I'm going to take another question. Um, it's around food waste and sanitation. They are major contributors to greenhouse gases emissions, but I don't see them mentioned enough, often, often enough. Are these initiatives being worked on in your organization or city? So maybe a question for, for Thomas, working with many cities. Yes, thanks, Alexander, and thanks for the question. So the, I think the shortest answer is that, yeah, every city is going to need to um, address issues related to food waste and, and food system related emissions, including the logistics of bringing food into the city um, and, and, and moving it around, storing it, et cetera. So that does need to be included as part of the, um, the European mission uh, for cities. Uh, and uh, we'll be helping cities specifically to address that as one of the key components of their action plan for the mission and for climate neutrality strategy. So that is something that they will be tackling. I think that you know there 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 has been a, a pretty robust field of work around how to reduce emissions re related to food waste, not only in terms of dealing with food once it is technically waste, but also how to reduce the amount of food waste. There are many strategies that can be taken that really prevent us from creating food waste in the first place by using it more effectively, ensuring that food that is um, uh, maybe not needed in one place has the ability to get to another place, et cetera. So there's a lot that can be done there and, and we need to help cities to, to do that as aggressively as possible as part of this plan. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so for Magali, um, so you mentioned Los Angeles regulation. Are you, are you in favor as a private entity of stricter environmental regulation when it comes to public buildings and construction in general in the city? We are absolutely asking for it and as i was saying if i had a, a magic stick i would uh, transform every public procurement standards to include um, the requirement of environmental product declaration which is basically using science to really look at what the full life cycle co2 of a product is i think really if you are serious about decarbonizing you shouldn't be afraid of science and data and to include that directly in the legal framework so we are absolutely asking for it there are many things um on we were talking about renovation this is so key with there's anything we can do to help the cities to renovate their buildings 
So yes, definitely in favor of uh, of legislation moving the right way to incentivize company and cities to do the right thing for the. Thank you. So private companies are also on board and pushing in the right direction. Uh, Bertrand, I want to give you the word for, for the end to close this panel. Yes. yes. For the Sovereign Pulse Foundation, of course, it's an important moment because it's the moment where we can publish this guide of solutions for cities. But I think this moment today is just the beginning, the early beginning of something new. And uh, with Thomas Oboda, I think there is so many things we can do to work with the coalition of cities for net zero. And uh, I think here we need success stories. We need to show what cities can do with this type of solutions in order to, to create the wish for other cities to be part of this alliance. And one way to do it, well, is to do it a little bit everywhere, of course, but maybe we can also do it massively in one place. And this one place, well, Carlos, it, we, it, would, be, it would be Lisbon, of course, not only because I love your city, but because I know how committed you are for using new solutions. Uh, the former commissioner for innovation is, of course, the one that is absolutely ideal to, to bring these uh, innovative solutions to, to, to the life of all the citizens. So I, I think the next step for me in my dreams would be to make an official event in Lisbon uh, doing exactly what you said about communication. We have to bring all the decision makers, all the stakeholders, all the media, and, and show really what we can do, give the wish to people to use them so they would come to you the citizens would come to you, Carlos, and, and beg for the implementation of these solutions instead of having you pushing for, for that. It would be a fantastic event. It would be fantastic success stories that would help also the, the Net Zero Cities Coalition to maybe have more members and maybe to ask us afterward to do the same type of events. We are here for that. We're here, really here for that. And when people ask me, what is driving the Solar Impulse Foundation to do all that uh, for, for free, open source? Uh, it's the frustration that not enough has been done practically and we want to do it really practically and we'd like to do it with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for the participants. And of course, people can follow the recording of this webinar in the future. Bye-bye and thank you to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for participating.